So tonight is the fifth in our series of lectures on Ireland, Republicanism and the political parties. Now, as the brochure advertising the series, which the board got, you know, explains, the Ireland Institute does aim to provide a forum for the discussion and development of the ideas of republicanism and to create an environment in which those ideas can flourish and can try to contribute to society. And republicanism, as we're all beginning to know now, it's a body of ideas about politics and society which started life way back in classical Athens, has developed a lot over the years, has been debated, was very, very influential, of course, in Ireland in the 1790s in particular. Um, and civic republicanism addresses questions of good government, the common good of all, how society can be run in the shared interests of all, and very much with the act of responsibility of citizens to be involved in that. Now, in the four meetings we've had so far, I think you could say we've had some real engagement, I think, between speakers and the audience. Not always agreement, but that doesn't matter. That's not the point. Really listening and hearing. But I think I could say that we haven't so far developed very much an engagement with the public and them as, as a body of ideas. And I think tonight we probably have potential for pushing that on a bit further. Now, you perhaps all noticed in a very thoughtful article in the Irish Times the other day, Lord O'Connor talking about the Hillsborough talks, she noted that there had been real engagement between the Ulster Unionist Party and Sinn Féin. But she also noted, and this is what I think would concern us as a body of people interested in Republican ideas, the real difficulties that politicians encounter when they have to report back to mutually suspicious communities. And as she pointed out, in an atmosphere that doesn't provide any kind of active encouragement to engagement, nor any kind of momentum to it. And of course, a basic aim of the Ireland Institute is to try to contribute to creating such an atmosphere. And I think we're very fortunate tonight that we have the Ulster Unionist Party and that we have Dr. Stephen King here to talk to us. Now, Dr. Stephen King, I'm sure, is very familiar to nearly all of us from television, if not from other meetings. And I suppose we know him very, very much as the political advisor to David Trimble and as one of the people who was very much involved in the negotiations that led up to the Good Friday Agreement. He has just told me something which I didn't know before, but I think you may be interested to know, that he did his doctorate on the political thinking on no less an Irish person than Charles Hoppy. So perhaps that's what we should have <laughs> asked him to talk about. But the party that he represents, the Ulster Unionist Party, of course, is the longest established in Ireland of all the political parties we've been having here. The, its origins go right back to the emergence of unionism as a politically organized force in the 1880s and then with the establishment of the Ulster Unionist Council in 1905. And as you know too, from the setting up of the Northern Ireland state in 19, from 1921 on, right up until direct rule in 1972, every government in Northern Ireland was an Ulster Unionist Party government. So it's with great pleasure that I ask Dr. Stephen King to give us his talk. Thank you. Do you if I sit? No, that be all right? I'm sure you can never, does it, Can everyone hear me if I sit? Yes. Is that all right? Yeah. Thanks very much. Well, yeah. Chairperson, it's a, it's a great privilege uh, to be with you uh, this evening in this house. It's right that the hopes of great historical figures should be preserved and restored. And I look to my right and I'm intrigued by this crown uh, in, the, in the fireplace. I wonder if it's original. Um, I, I'm not sure. But, uh, I, I, myself, I was involved in a, in a small way, unsuccessfully recently, in trying to have Seamus Heaney's house in Ashley Avenue in Belfast uh, retained for posterity. Um, I say that about this house, despite, and, and this will not surprise, uh, not surprise you, Patrick Pierce is far from uh, being a hero of mine. 
too, too romantic, too idealistic, too addicted to the notion of blood sacrifice. But then it has to be said, I'm not very much given to, to heroes. Uh, I'm very well aware of Sir Edward Carson's neuroses and flaws, and while Sir James Craig, I suppose, is a, is a rather more anti-heroic figure. Tonight, Chairman, it's, it's not my intention to, to kick around the actually existing republic, to praise its successes, to circle its flaws. Rather, I want to examine the claims of Irish republicanism as we have known them uh, in the North, and to test them. Hopefully, I shall elucidate why unionism and republican republicanism have been opposed before looking to a future which, one hopes, will be based on cooperation where that is possible and peaceful contestation where it is not. So where, does, where, where, where should I start? Well, I suppose the proclamation of independence is as good a place as any. It goes, Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her own tradition of nationhood, Ireland through us summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. From this we can, we can say that Ireland is, for Republicans, very much a nation. There's no ifs and no buts about that. It goes on. Having organized and trained her manhood, not her womanhood, I notice, Jeffrey, through her secret revolutionary organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organizations, the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, she now seizes that moment, and supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe, but relying in the first on her own strength, she strikes in full confidence of victory. So the Republican cause is a right one, and, and it's a one that's in tune with history. Republicans are on the right side of history. Uh, we, we can take that from the, the proclamation. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it ever be extinguished, except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the last 300 years, they have asserted it to arms. From this, we can take it that there's only one people in Ireland, and that it is right and justified that force of arms be used to give that people a state. It goes on. Standing on that fundamental right, and again asserting it in arms, in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign and independent state. And we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare, and of its exaltation among the nations. Here we see a dedication not only to Irish freedom, but to Ireland's welfare. Republicans have been divided, though, as to how that welfare is best guaranteed. Certainly, we see here no commitment to a necessarily Connollyite vision of Ireland. The Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally, and oblivious of the difference caref differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which have divided the minority from the majority of the past. Here, of course, we have coded reference to unionism. Unionism is an illegitimate foreign ideology, unionists themselves deluded. The proclamation ends, until our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of a permanent, nas permanent national representative of the whole people of Ireland, elected by the suffragists of all her men and women, the provisional government hereby constituted will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic in trust for the people. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessing we invoke upon our arms, and we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonor it by cowardice, inhumanity, or rapine. In this supreme hour, the Irish nation must, by its valor and discipline, and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good, prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called. Clearly, as we can see, this is not to be any secular republic, but nor is it expressly a Gaelic one. To this image of the republican vision, then, ladies and gentlemen, that Ireland is historically culturally and geographically one single unit, that there was or is for Republicans nothing for it but violence, that the Republican cause is an anti-colonial one, and not a sectarian, but neither a godless one, and that it is one concerned for the welfare of the people in Ireland, we can add a few more ingredients, perhaps. First, that Republicans see themselves as inheritors of a defenderist legacy. It is not that the Republic is necessarily inimical to the true interests of Protestants or current Unionists, but the Republican cause is, to most Republicans' minds, about the defense of Catholics who've been the victims of British imperialism. 
Second to this mix must be added the right that the Republican cause is most certainly a national cause. Partition, as imposed by Britain against the will of the Irish people, according to Republican, is necessarily an illegitimate evil. So how do unionists respond to these claims in the modern context? Let me take first nationalist defense. The history of British-Irish relations is most certainly complex and marked by much spilled blood, British and Irish. In the face of the crisis in Northern Ireland, there was a need, according to Republicans, to protect vulnerable Catholic communities from sectarian attack. This has remained a central part of the Republican self-image throughout the modern Troubles. The troubles are usually defined as beginning in 1968 or 1969, but the reality, the truth, is that they actually began several years earlier, in 1966, with the emergence of uh, the new self-styled so-called Ulster also Volunteer Force and the murder of Matilda Gould, John Scullion, and Peter Ward. These murders coincide with the birth of the Civil Rights Association, a Republican-founded movement that drew in support from a wide range of mainly Catholic, but also left-wing Protestant interests. Seeking peaceful reform, they met with violent resistance. Although some of the directions civil rights followed, particularly those of the people's democracy, <coughs> particularly so, so, although some of these directions can be criticized in hindsight, there can be no justification for the violence that ensued, even if it is probably fair to say that some elements deliberately provoked such resistance. The worst violence erupted in August 1969, with communities on both sides uprooted from their homes. And while Catholics were involved in attacking the police and Protestants, it was Catholics who suffered the brunt of the attacks. It was from the different perceptions of that month, Catholics seeing the state as being either unwilling or unable to protect them, Protestants seeing the warnings of Republican insurgency vindicated, that flowed the cycle of killing. When we look back, the need for Catholic self-defense becomes strikingly sensible. Indeed, Catholics today in parts of Northern Ireland are still under attack, most notably in parts of County Antrim, where no Republican threat exists. Likewise, I'm thinking here of places like Clear Place, Protestants cling to their homes. But has the Republican movement been successful at defense? The answer, in my view, must be no. It is true that there were some Republican successes, the so-called Battle of St. Matthews, which was the defense of the short strand, but many hundreds of Catholics still died and continue to die. Furthermore, Republicans were directly responsible, and still are periodically, for Catholic deaths, be they Catholic policemen who were deliberately targeted, the victims of indiscriminate bombings, or those at the receiving end of so-called IRA justice. Furthermore, IRA actions often prompted direct loyalist retaliation. So while Republicans were able to hit back, they were unable to defend successfully. On the contrary, Republicans' hands are soaked in Catholic blood. It is worth noting here, too, that Republicans have been responsible for by far the majority of the blood spilled in the last generation. In fact, about two-thirds of it. Another quarter by loyalist paramilitaries, about 10% of it by the security forces. Most strikingly of all, the IUC were responsible for only a little more than 1% of the deaths, yet suffered 302 losses themselves, which gives you some idea of union's attachment to that force. Which takes me to my second point, partition as an unfairness. I don't think anyone disagrees that Catholics have suffered disadvantage and at times discrimination in Northern Ireland, particularly in the pre troubles era in the fields of employment, housing, and electoral practice. There is much disagreement about the causes and extent of this disadvantage, but no one seriously denies it. Certainly, Northern Ireland was no apartheid South Africa, no Holocaust society. That is Republican propaganda and is, admi it is, and is admitted as such by many Republicans. Discrimination was not confined to either Irish state, nor to one religious community, but it is fair to say the balance of it, given the weight of power in Northern Ireland, worked against Catholic interests. The vast bulk of the civil rights demands, though, either had been conceded or were on the way to being conceded before the emergence of the modern provisional IRA. Discrimination, understandable or not, was wrong. It was also ultimately self-defeating. It's a sustained grievance culture, which the Republican movement feeds off daily. Structural disadvantage, though, is a much more complex and difficult problem to resolve. Some Republicans say the fact that the differential in unemployment rates has remained constant despite ruthless attempts to stamp them out points to ever more insidious attempts to discriminate. But if that was so, why does the differential only exist for Catholic men? Catholic women in Northern Ireland are no more likely to be unemployed than Protestant women. In fact, Catholics hold a disproportionate number of the female middle class jobs in Northern Ireland. So I conclude from this that Northern Ireland is not inherently unfair to Catholics, while admitting that the majority of past discrimination was suffered by Catholics. On the contrary, 
Interestingly, Catholic unemployment in the 26 counties here is actually higher than Protestant unemployment. Does this make this state an orange regime? Hardly. Moving on. Ireland as a nation. Is Northern Ireland fundamentally illegitimate? For Republicans, this has been a simple matter. Self-determination was a matter for the people on the island as a whole. In the early 20th century, they expressed a majority nationalist opinion, but this was overruled by Britain with partition. The goal must be to end partition. But what is a nation? A nation exists when members recognize each other as compatriots and believe that they share relevant characteristics. Clearly, then, there is an Irish nation. But what of those who undeniably consider their interests, economic, cultural, political, and symbolic, to be better protected and advanced by another state other than that which operates out of this city? If nationalists and republicans felt they could give little loyalty to the British state, can a similar argument not be made by people in the Northeast who do not feel they can give their loyalty to this state? Does one island necessarily mean one nation? If so, does that mean that Scotland is not a nation because it is on the same island as England? Few in Ireland would say yes to that question. Therefore, it seems people belong to a nation only if they themselves regard themselves part of that nation. People, it seems logical, cannot be forced to belong to a nation. I think, though, that the Republican argument is not purely one of national self-determination. It's a historical <coughs> argument that Ireland was treated as one unit for all of the 19th century and should be treated as one unit now for the purposes of self-determination. To this, I can only reply that it is a fact that Ireland was treated as one unit, but since the 1920s as two units. It is, to my mind, too simplistic to imagine that Britain imposed partition without reference to the deep divisions in Irish society that existed at that time. It is true that the border does not and cannot neatly follow political or sometimes geographical contours, but it does approximate to the different political communities. A better border was rejected by the Free State Government in 1925. So we have two views of self-determination, geographical self-determination and popular self-determination. It was therefore wise, and I pay tribute to John Hume here, to find a new way of expressing the will of the Irish peoples, namely the dual referendum of 1998, which to my mind better reflects the will of all the people on the island today than any general election, and it was a general election, not a referendum, in 1918. It is, as John Hume acknowledges, the division of the Irish people that keeps the border in place, not British self-interest. Which leads me to the next point in the Republican argument. Ireland was and Northern Ireland is a colony. I would not seek to pretend that Britain or London does not have interests in Ireland. It might not have selfish, strategic or economic interests, but neither is it just some neutral arbiter in a unionist, nationalist, Protestant, Catholic conflict. Indeed, it is reasonable to suggest that it was London's desire to insulate itself from the problems of Northern Ireland that perpetuated the problems that lay behind the troubles. But nor does Britain as imperial villain stand up to scrutiny, in my mind. Sean McBride once suggested that Britain would not leave Ireland even if the Unionists asked her to do so. If he was not wrong then, he would most certainly be wrong today. The idea that an expensive, turbulent, frequently embarrassing territory is held onto because there is some advantage in doing so is hard to accept. Is Northern Ireland a colony? But certainly in the period 1801 to 1922, Ireland was part of the UK state, but also place apart. The British Empire was coloured by Protestantism, so the fact that Ireland was overwhelmingly Catholic was bound to be a potential problem. That Catholic emancipation did not coincide with the Union must rank as one of the major tragedies of British policy towards Ireland. Between the end of the last war and 1970, Britain withdrew from 26 different territories. No wonder the Republican movement saw themselves in the 1960s as following in line with the historical development. But the truth is, that the Irish have been colonizers as much as colonized. More Irish people have actually fought for the British Empire than have ever actually fought against it. The truth is that the people of this island tend to define themselves far more by religion than by origin. If that were so, if that were not so, why are there prominent unionists with names like McGuinness, Kennedy, the Gypsy, and McConnell? And Ireland has not only been more intermingled with Britain than other colonies, but it had, and Northern Ireland has, representation in the Imperial Parliament. Moreover, Northern Ireland is distinguished from Algeria, for instance, because in no part of Algeria did those willingly part of the French Empire form a majority. This has not stopped Republicans identifying their struggle with anti-colonial or legitimate liberation struggles, and also at times, it has to be said, some very dubious causes like Nazism. Sometimes, of course, Republicans international associations have had less to do with ideological sympathy than with military requirements. 
Which brings me to another fundamental aspect of the Republican self-image, the rightness of taking up arms. Since the 26 counties gained autonomy and then independence, most Republicans and nationalists have argued. Of course, yes. Of course, I'm sorry. Since the 26 counties gained autonomy and then independence, most Republicans and nationalists have argued that taking up arms for political purposes was either wrong or counterproductive. Some, notably the IRA and Sinn Féin, have taken a different view. They long argued that Northern Ireland was irreformable that violence was the only way. It was understandable they came to this conclusion. The state had been less than even-handed. The civil rights movement had met much hostility and occasional violence. And unionism was hamstrung by hardline, Paisleyite elements. Yet today, the vast bulk of Republican opinion has indeed settled for a reformed Northern Ireland, even if it is one that Republicans paint as transitional. Republicans can now argue that they helped bring about reform even if they fail to bring about a unitary Irish state. I would argue, though, that violence has only held back reform. The position we are in today is one that was achievable, arguable, arguably on better terms for Republicans in the 1970s, and violence only made the necessary compromises by Britain and unionism harder to contemplate. Moreover, because Republican violence was met by loyalist violence, and because it was not directed solely at mainland British targets, the violence made the cost of Britain leaving, as well as staying, higher. Because the violence only hardened unionist attitudes, it pretty much guaranteed that, union could, union, that London could not leave without even worse carnage ensuing. So violence has only sharpened divisions, not lessened them. It has guaranteed reform that might have been possible anyway, and it ultimately gave Republicans a seat at the table in the talks, ensuring their prisoners were released and seats in government. It is counter-historical to ask, what if there had been no violence? Would the Republican project be any closer to achievement? But the militant Republican view is certainly very contestable. Perhaps, though, the fact that Republicans who had been prepared to take up arms for the Republican argument were brought to a stalemate and had to modify their views on crucial issues like consent has made it easier for other Republicans and nationalists to alter their attitudes. What do I mean? Simply, the fact that violence for the sake of republicanism has actually been shown not to work means that the violent argument has been disproved. It has been tried. In future, fewer will be tempted to try it. It is no longer just a hypothesis that violence will not work. It's been tried and been proved to make things in very many ways worse. I'm near the end. The national struggle as a popular, even class struggle. Certainly, in recent years, many Republicans, particularly the violent sort, have emphasized a revolutionary aspect of their politics. They sought not merely to extend the boundaries of the existing 26-county republic. Not all Republicans are socialists by any means, though. Theobald Wolfe Tone most certainly was not some radical defender of the oppressed classes. Frankly, Republicans have a tendency to turn the socialism on, in Cuba, for instance, and off again in the United States. Interestingly, while Sinn Féin adopts populist left-wing causes down here in the republic, it has faithfully implemented public-private partnership schemes in Northern Ireland. The evidence is that when it achieves power, Sinn Féin, like Fianna Foyle before it, becomes compromised. We can argue the merits of socialism, but it is safe to say that social revolution is not necessarily a consequence of national revolution in the Irish case. Rather, Irish republicanism is far more colored by Catholic experience than any socialist vision, which leads me to the penultimate point. Republicanism as non-sectarian or even anti-sectarian. Republicans deny far more emphatically than unionists do that they are motivated by some sectarian impulse. It's a national cause, not a Catholic cause. The truth is that experience in Ireland does not define itself neatly as either religious or national. Rather, definitions have overlaid one another. The state that Irish nationalism produced in 1922 was deeply affected by the thinking of one religious denomination just as the British state and empire were marked by a Protestant self-image. Trying to remove these religious dimensions and describe or account for the evolutions of British and Irish histories without them is nigh impossible. What I mean is the conflict has not been purely sectarian, and nor has it been wholly ethno-national and rational either. Unionism and republicanism alike are both affected by the historic experience of the groups from which they derive support. 
So while the republicanism is not wholly driven by Catholic antagonism, the IRA could have killed far more Protestant civilians. It most certainly has not, has not acted in a way so as to re reduce division either. Those intensified ha hatreds will unfortunately far outlast the violence itself. And Republicans, I hope, are beginning to learn that what they saw as a blow against the state, the murder of a UDR man, for instance, were perceived as attacks on Protestantism as much as unionism by the victims' families. There are some, my friend Martin Manser in particular, who try to identify a consistent Protestant or dissenter trend to Republicanism. This flies in the face of the overwhelming experience in my view. This leads me on to my final point. Unionism as an alien manufactured aberration. Republicanism's problem is that while it sustained and nurtured it, the aspiration towards independence from Britain, Catholic grievance, and Gaelic culture has overwhelmingly repelled Ulster unionists rather than attracted them. To claim unionists as part of the Irish nation, while simultaneously defining true Irishness in terms with which they do not identify, is unlikely to prove effective. And that's another statement. Of course, Republican purists like George Gilmour might have called unionism merely a Brit creation. But what is striking about unionism, surely, is how resilient, even in the face of British unfaithfulness, it has proved. Unionists have not meekly accepted what London has mapped out for them. Likewise, unionist resolve to remain in the UK has not been weakened by Republican violence. Quite the contrary. As Jerry Adams said in New York last February, in words that might as well have been directed at the IRA and words which I don't feel have actually received uh, enough uh, coverage. He said, I don't think we can force on unionism an all Ireland state that doesn't have their assent or consent and doesn't reflect their sense of being comfortable. This was a big step forward indeed. And for all the difficulties and differences at the moment in the peace process, I would not want in any way to deny the progress that has been made. Republicanism and unionism have both moved considerably. Many unionists today are seeking ways of bringing republicanism into the system, respecting democratic norms, of course, rather than keeping it out. We seek a Northern Ireland that is confident, pluralist, and non-sectarian, one that can find the magnanimity to offer a home not only to those who are British, but also to those among us who regard themselves as primarily Irish, even to those who have taken up arms in the past against some of the other inhabitants. One that is unafraid of differing identities and allegiances, a Northern Ireland that will respect and protect them all. One that turns its back forever on violence. Yes, we seek a Northern Ireland still part of the UK, but not one that is either more Irish, or for that matter more British, than its inhabitants really desire. We want, we need North-South connections, just as the East-West connection remains important. The sooner we clear away the detritus of conflict, the better. Best to to leave the border well alone. This generation made its views clear in 1998. I've outlined to you my critique of Irish republicanism as we in Northern Ireland have experienced it. And as I said a moment ago, we want to see an inclusive form of government in Northern Ireland. As unionists, I would hope we would bring our experience of parliamentary democracy with us, our distrust of grand schemes, our commitment to civil and religious liberty for minorities, however defined, our absolute commitment to law and order, and not least, our Protestant prudence with the public finances. But what of republicanism? What does it, it have to contribute? Having republicanism inside the system must be about more than just not having them bombing the system from the outside. Are there positive aspects of the republican ethic with which unionism can find common ground? I would hope so, and I think it can. But it requires an acceptance that the republican project need not necessarily entail nationalist self-determination. As David Cook, a former Alliance Party member Alliance Party Mayor of Belfast put it a few years ago, if those cultures, Catholic Ireland and Protestant Ulster, either cannot or should not be subjugated to the other, a pluralist form of government or way of governing society is the only possible way of proceeding. It is the only possible way of proceeding, however complicated pluralism is, and however antipathetic it may be to the certainties proclaimed by cultural determinists, who assert that there neither can nor should be pluralism in Ireland, and that either the Catholic or Protestant values must predominate over the other, either because the one set of values is true, or because the other is false, or because we hate them, or because if we give an inch, it will be on the slippery slope to United Ireland, or because the Irish nation cannot be made unless it purifies itself against all things British. 
Surely, rather than focusing on the bloody border, the job for real Republicans is to focus on goals such as liberty, such as equality, such as fraternity, such as justice. I believe in Northern Ireland and in Ireland today, we've moved a long way towards achieving structures that allow for and encourage diversity and respect. Such a pluralist framework must be so tolerant as to allow for respect for those who are still more content with a framework containing monarchical, even post-imperial elements. In short, the task for unionists and nationalists alike is to accept the benefits of a heterogeneous society in place of the homogenizing myths of national identity. That means becoming citizens as well as subjects or members of some tribe. This is not easy, but I would hope the politics of Northern Ireland and of Ireland for my generation can move away from the literally deadening debates about which state we live in to what kind of state we live in. In short, can we create an equal or equitable society without crushing difference? That is the challenge, ladies and gentlemen, in the 21st century Ireland. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. That was indeed a very challenging talk and covered a lot of ground. So I'm sure you have lots of questions and points of view to put forward. So um, we do have, uh, luckily, quite a good deal of time to do that. So it's open now. Dalton. Well, I start, yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to add to my compliments to the speaker uh, for quite a thoughtful and analytical statement. The fact that uh, some of us uh, wouldn't necessarily agree with all the analysis is not the point. It's far from rhetoric, denunciation, or proclamation. And uh, I think that's very welcome, something to engage with. I have uh, two questions, one of them quite specific, and the other much uh, broader. One is, I, I, and I may be wrong in my recollection about this, but I think that the speaker in uh, a column that he contributes to the Belfast Telegraph occasionally, uh, a while ago, uh, addressed the issue, if I'm confusing with somebody else, forgive me, and then just state your own opinion on the subject, uh, referred to the prospect of the Irish Republic joining the British Commonwealth. And that the uh, reaction was, it really wouldn't make much difference to unionists one way or the other. And I think that the um, <coughs> attitude of that uh, is quite interesting in the context of debates that you've been in, because they're very often posited on the, the value that such a step, if it were to be taken, uh, would have. But if the reaction is indifferent, it would take some, a bit of steam out of that debate. So whether I'm recollecting correctly about your column or uh, not, uh, perhaps you give me your, 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 own, uh, your own view on that. Secondly, um, you, you were talking about unionists and their attitudes uh, to republicans and to nationalists, and at a certain point you referred to British unfaithfulness. Now, I think that all of the evidence that I have seen, sociological nature, research, and manifest in political statements, uh, some of them indiscreet, whether it be Patrick Mayhew to a German newspaper, whatever else it may be, uh, would seem to indicate that on the island of Britain, if you were to hold a referendum uh, on the continuance of the United Kingdom in its precise sense of yeah. Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that a majority of people would vote on that island of Britain against the continuance of that United Kingdom. Uh, I would suggest you, I don't know whether you would accept that as a, as near to a fact as possible, but the research seems to indicate that. And I often perceive, understandably so, that that seems to gall unionists. But I mean, whatever about your attitude to nationalists and your attitude to republicans, what is the, uh, what is the thought through consequence of the fact that whatever you want to call the community or state of which you wish to be a part sees a majority, a very substantial majority, on the island comprised of Scotland, England, and Wales saying, we don't identify with you, we don't see you as part of our community, we don't want you, we want to end the union. Those are the process of putting that. Yeah, those are quite substantial, so I'll, I'll take get them now if you don't mind. Um, yeah, on the first point about the Commonwealth, you're absolutely right, I did write a, a column, uh, I, I, I wrote every week on a Wednesday for the Telegraph. Uh, I did write a column a couple of years back now on the yeah, Commonwealth. Yeah, it wouldn't be as far as that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, my attitude to the Commonwealth is, and I mean, I was here in Dublin, I think it was in Dublin Castle when Secretary General, um, I forgot his name, Anyoku or something from Nigeria, Secretary General of the Commonwealth came to speak in Dublin. 
Um, and a couple of the Taoiseach's top guys who took me to one side afterwards and said, mm, well, what do you think of this? I said, well, it's only going to cost you £400,000 a year, isn't it? So it's, <laughs> my attitude is to the Commonwealth is that I, I don't see that if we've, if we've all moved on, I don't see why Ireland shouldn't be a member of the Commonwealth. I mean, whatever people's views on, on what Britain has done to Ireland and, and, and so forth, and, and even whatever your views about the fact that the Queen is the head of the Commonwealth, I think if you look, we've got 51 countries in the Commonwealth now, including Mozambique, where I was last year, um, which has, as far as I know, no connections with, with Britain at all. Um, but you've got countries in there that I would argue could claim to have suffered far, far more at British hands than Ireland. And I'm thinking particularly of, of a country like India, which has been a member of the Commonwealth since, since it, it achieved its independence. So I don't see why Ireland shouldn't be a member of the Commonwealth. I think, as, as I said to one of the Taoiseach's guys, you know, I think it's just about us all kind of growing up and, and you know, putting some of the past antipathies behind us. However, um, I think I did say in that column that I don't think Ireland will join the Commonwealth, um, and I also don't think that it would have very much impact on unionist attitudes. Um, actually, Commonwealth Day was, I think, Monday of this week. And as far as I'm aware, um, because the Assembly is suspended, there was no celebration of Commonwealth Day in Northern Ireland. Um, the last couple of years, the Assembly has voted money uh, for communities to, to stage events. And we, we've actually been using it as quite a useful way because most of the ethnic minorities in, in Northern Ireland are, are from Commonwealth countries, um, places like Hong Kong, places like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, but we've used it as a way of, of highlighting the positive contribution that, that the ethnic communities uh, make to Northern Ireland. So I think Commonwealth Day can be quite positive. Um, but unfortunately, because of suspension and because the Northern Ireland Office just doesn't regard Commonwealth Day as something that it can uh, put any money behind, we didn't have any celebration of it. So I don't think Commonwealth Day, I think Commonwealth Day actually means quite a lot to the ethnic minorities in Northern Ireland. I don't think it means very much to the unionist community in the, sort of, in the, the narrow definition of what I mean by the unionist community, I mean white Protestant people. Um, I just think, you know, it's a, it's a useful thing, the Commonwealth. I think it does have some moral authority. I think it has dealt very well with issues like South Africa. Um, but I don't think it would actually have any fundamental impact on unionist attitudes per se. On the, the, the question of British unfaithfulness, um, I, I would I just take a little bit of issue, Dalton, with your um, with, with the, the figures you gave. There was a poll in um, the summer of 2001 in The Guardian which asked people a very blunt question. Do you want Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom or do you want it to become part of the Northern Ireland Republic? Now, if I remember rightly, 40% wanted it to become part of the Northern Ireland Republic, 26% wanted it to remain part of the United Kingdom, and the other 34% either didn't have a view or don't know where Northern Ireland is or something like that. <laughs> um, having said that, other opinion polls which have been taken on this question have asked a broader range of alternatives. And if you offer people other alternatives, actually, I remember there was a poll about five years ago, and the most attractive alternative for, for people in, in, in Great Britain was actually the Northern Ireland should become an independent country. So. Um, if you put it in stark terms, Union, United Ireland, yes, there are more people of the United Ireland, but there's probably, well, there is well, certainly, I think, a majority of opinion in Great Britain which wants something other than the United Ireland. Now, they don't necessarily want the Union, but they might want joint authority, or they might want Northern Ireland to be an independent country, or, or whatever. Um, how does this affect Unionist attitudes? So well, Chico, just uh, yeah. interject briefly, yeah. that really, I'm not suggesting that the majority of people in Britain necessarily want a united Ireland, but I'm just wondering how unionists react to the fact they want them out of the United Kingdom. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, some people do take great offence at this, and, and there's, there's no denying that. And, 
and people say, oh, they just don't want us. And, and then, unfortunately, most people who kind of think that way and, and take great personal offense then tend to have come to very nihilistic conclusions, which is that what we have to do is, you know, take to the streets or join a paramilitary organization or something, as if you could actually, you know, make people love you by by calling them every name under the sun and, and by taking up arms and killing innocent people and, and that kind of thing. I mean, it, it makes no sense to me at all. Um, no, I think they, uh, I think it does impact on people, but I think it also, while some people take this very extreme and nihilistic uh, view of it, I think other, it causes other people to, to be more uh, thoughtful in their approach. And people say, well, look, you know, we are a financial drain, we are turbulent, um, we do do things which look more British than the rest of the British, um, and maybe we need to kind of rein ourselves in a wee bit. Um, and I think that, you know, the deal, the, the deal has been quite clear from, from, from every London government, whether it's Labour or Conservative, to the Unionists, it's make your peace with the Nationalists, and you can stay as long as you like, and we'll keep giving you the money. Um, but you better behave, and I think people recognize that. Um, so it has two effects. It causes some people to go off in a very extreme direction. It causes other people to kind of moderate themselves. Um, but people understand it. Um, there's, there's no denying um, that, that, that you know, there is this hostility towards Northern Ireland. And yet, at the same time, I would say, if you look at the number of, of um, national companies, when I say national companies, I mean British companies, which are now in Northern Ireland, which didn't used to be the case during the Troubles. So you've now got, you know, far, there used to be one branch of Marks and Spencer's, there's now ten branches of Marks and Spencer's. We didn't have things like Sainsbury's and Tesco's and, and all these other British companies. But now you've got people who are working, you know, managers in these companies are now going off to conferences and, and that kind of thing in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, we had the, the Transport and General Workers had their first conference since 1904 in Belfast. So in many ways, people are actually mixing in a, in a British milieu. And I don't, as far as I'm aware, I don't think people encounter hostility at that level. They don't encounter a personal hostility from English or Scottish or Welsh people. It's just Northern Ireland, financial drag, people die there. Um, the prods don't, don't behave very well sometimes. We hate the Orange Order. Um, but I don't think, I think, you know, that, that there is this other, uh, this other thing which is going on, which is actually a more integrating effect that's going on through, through globalization or capitalism or something like that. Good. Yeah. Shakespeare, what ish my nation? In the case of the unionists, that you said yourself, one of the definitions of nation, very pointedly in relation to this island, is a certain kind of compatriotism. Yeah. But if, if the unionists find that the Scottish, English, and the Welsh do not see themselves as part of the same community in terms of the United Kingdom. What is the Unionist nation? Well, that, and I finished it's, it's, this, is, this is a very, very deep, interesting question. Um, I, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. I mean, um, is there a British nation? Certainly the idea of, of the Union was to create mm. one nation. In these islands, and that was the question. Sorry, the question was what what what, what nation do unionists belong to? Effectively, Is that, yeah. What nation do the unionists belong to? And I was saying that, that when the nation when the when the union was was first put together, I'm talking about the early 19th century. The idea was to create one nation in the British Isles. Now, as I said earlier, one of the problems was that they didn't give Catholic emancipation. So so this became a this didn't work. Effectively, and then you have a change in the sort of 1830s, and the idea is is that we'll instead of creating one British nation, that we'll will allow for, for differences in the regions and, and so forth. So I, I I don't know what unionist nation is. I mean, I um, I think most people most people are unionist. Well, I'll, I'll answer it in a different way. I, mean, I think it, it, it's it, it's it's become quite hackneyed now, but. I mean, when Richard Rose did his study of Unionist attitudes in the late 60s, I mean, a third of Unionists said that they were Irish, a third said they were British, and a third said they were Ulster. And now if you ask people, 
you'll find half of them say British and half of them say Ulster and none of them say Irish. So something has gone on in the last 30 years, I think we know what it is, um, which has actually meant that the idea of being part of the Irish nation is quite, uh, it's something like anathema to, to most unionists now. Um, I think unionists see themselves as being part of a community, first and foremost. They see themselves as being part of this community of, of, of Protestant Ulster um, or Unionist Ulster. Uh, they see themselves as having historical ties to the rest of the island. They are very attached to their British citizenship. Um, I don't know what nation they belong to, but they they've got they operate on several different levels. 